Good morning and welcome no to session three of our business insurance webinar series on employee benefits. And again, a special welcome and thank you to our presenter, John Jeffries from Ulster Insurance Services. I'm your moderator, Renee Goodno from the New York Small Business Development Center. Now, our services are made possible by the U.S. Small Business Administration, the state of New York, and our host campuses. If you have any questions during the webinar, please don't hesitate to type them in your chat box and we will answer them as we go. And with that, I will turn things over to you, John. Thank you for everybody uh, coming in here uh, this uh, this afternoon, early October, or mid-October at this point. Uh, so uh, right off the bat, I just want to get into uh, what's the purpose of uh, the webinar, just to make sure you're in the right place. Uh, the purpose here is to get yourself uh, more educated so you become a, uh, a better buyer. Uh, a lot of people out there are making choices and buying things, and uh, I don't know if everybody completely understands what they're buying. Uh, and this won't have all the answers for that, but it hopefully will give you enough uh, pieces of knowledge in order to make better choices going forward or uh, ask better questions. Uh, and it's, that really is the point, is to make better choices, uh, because this can make a huge uh, difference in people's lives, especially uh, the employee benefits. Uh, my background is that I've been in the insurance in industry 11 years. Uh, several of those years, I did focus on life and health products, which are the the employee benefits products. Uh, I'm an employee of Ulster Savings Bank, uh, which is a uh, the owner of Ulster Insurance Services, Inc. We are an insurance broker. We're not an insurance company. So what we do is we work with other insurance companies in order to provide uh, insurance for different businesses. In this case, it would be health insurers, life insurers, disability insurance companies, things of that nature. So what is insurance? And uh, if you've been with the last three sessions, you've, you've heard me go through this already, but uh, it's a transference of risk from one party to another. Uh, in this case, what I've run into a lot over the years when sitting down with people is they're like, well, why don't I just save up the money and then I'll pay for it myself? And that's great logic if you have time to save up before a major illness hits. Most of us first don't know what the cost really will be, but then at the same time, who has time to save up before something really bad happens? When it comes to health insurance, life insurance, disability, it's it's too much to ask for somebody who's 25, who has okay to a car accident and can't go to work, to have saved up enough money to provide for themselves uh, until they, they hit age 65 and Social Security starts to kick in. There is a, a risk that we walk around with every day, and employee benefits helps us to kind of satisfy some of the risk that comes with that. Why do people offer health, employee health benefits? Uh, why do we offer them? Uh, depending on the size of your business, it may be different reasons. Uh, what I find is many times uh, it's a family. It's a family business. So you're protecting your family. Uh, you're buying insurance uh, in group format to protect your family. Uh, so. If that's the case, there's nothing wrong with that. You just have to make sure that you are, in fact, a group. Uh, now, in New York State, there is a individual health insurance uh, marketplace that actually exists. There didn't used to be. It used to be people would um, actually start up businesses and, and run them in order just to get uh, affordable health care. So that was something that used to happen in New York State, and people used to use associations and things like that. But now there is individual marketplaces available. So businesses, I find it's less uh, often that it's just for the family itself uh, because of the way the rules have changed. Uh, the other is to attract and keep uh, quality employees. You don't want to lose an employee simply because you didn't offer health insurance, simply because somebody else offered vision or dental or something that may uh, be in the company's best interest to offer so that you're not losing talent. Uh, everyone knows that it costs money to bring on new people. And then you have the trial period. You're trying to figure out whether this person fits or not. And then if they finally find somebody who does fit, you don't want to lose them over something like uh, whether you do or do not offer health insurance. That, that's really one of the, the main benefits here. Uh, and uh, some people feel it's a duty to take care of employees to offer. None of these are bad reasons. Uh, what, basically what we do as brokers is help people to make good choices so that they balance these things because you also obviously can't spend so much on benefits that you can't make a profit. So you have to find a balance and that's really what uh, we're, we're trying to do here is, is find a way that you make good choices so that you're finding that balance. Whether it's taking care of employees, taking care of your family, or you're just looking to attract and, and keep quality employees. So what we're going to cover today is, is kind of a broad spectrum. Uh, so it's going to go from health insurance, dental, vision, group life, 
short-term disability, long-term disability, and then accident and others. So that's kind of our hodgepodge. Uh, that one's going to have many different things that are offered as employee benefits. I'm not going to get into all of them because we just don't have the time. This is going to be a very broad uh, coverage. None of these is going to be gone into with a significant amount of depth just because we only have a half hour. But there, uh, we are going to kind of touch on each of these. So the first is health insurance. This is the biggest one when it comes to the frequency that an employer will have it available, but also the, the biggest one in terms of premium. Uh, I don't think it's a shock to anyone that insurance premiums have gone up significantly over the years. Uh, I mean, it was only I don't know, eight years ago that I had $300 insurance plans that I could help people uh, pick out. And it's just not available anymore. There's nothing in that range. Uh, and for some reason, it's regulation that put it, uh, made that the case. And for other reasons, it's just the cost of healthcare has gone up. So there's, there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, but basically, health insurance pays for prevention and the treatment of illness or injury. So if you get sick, it helps pay for the doctor business, it pays for the hospital, it pays for uh, the the ambulance trip, and it also pays for medications. It's built into the health insurance. They can't separate it out at this point uh, under under the current laws. The key questions you want to ask when picking your coverage, uh, and, and this is where I find it's not a choice of good versus bad companies out there. Uh, when guiding people through this process, it's almost certainly going to come down to these factors as to which plans work best for you. The first one is, are you or most of your employees doctors in the network? If your doctor's not in the network, what good is the insurance? If you don't go to the doctor, whatever ailment you have, it could get worse and you're not taking care of yourself. So one of the first things you want to look at is if you have a doctor that you're, that you're loyal to, that you've been with for years, you want to make sure that they're going to take the insurance. It's step one. Uh, in, when it comes to trying to find out for employees, this can be a challenge. And depending on the size of your business, you may want to put out a spreadsheet saying, give me a list of doctors that you see on a regular basis. This is one of those areas where having an outside professional do it kind of takes away some of that, you getting into employees' private business. But it is kind of essential that you make sure that if you're picking something out, that the employees can use it. Uh, the other is, are your, your uh, employees' medications part of the formulary? The formulary is the list of prescriptions that this particular insurance company um, uses. Uh, what are the co-pays involved? Uh, how is that formulary decided? When are they going to say you can use branding versus when you should use uh, generic? Again, this is an area where you do want to have a good indication. And you may, depending on the size of your business, you may know that uh, Frank in payroll has diabetes and he's going to need metformin uh, every single month. But you don't always know, especially when it comes to mental health things. So you, you do want to kind of get a feel for this. And that's where having somebody outside that kind of adds to some anonymity uh, to the process. That, that is something that... Uh, uh, you can do in order to kind of take that burden off your shoulders so you don't have to worry about it. Can you afford the deductible? I've seen people push deductibles so high that they could not afford the deductible, even though they were saving money, uh, and also know your personality and your employees' personalities. I've seen people who avoided uh, expensive tests that may have detected cancer simply because they could not afford the deductible. Uh, the, the the people could have could have had cancer and had it develop and get worse because they didn't want to take a uh, a uh, a test because it was expensive. Now I had already laid out everything on paper. I'd shown how the deductible was. It was extremely high deductible. But I also showed that the amount that they were saving that year in premium was greater than the deductible. The family did have the money, but that ugly bill that was going to show up kept them from taking the test. You have to know your personality. If it's if a high deductible is going to keep you from seeking treatment, lower the deductible. Because this is health. This is this is your life that you're talking about here. So you, you do want to make sure that you are making choices that fit the personality, not just uh, ones and zeros, not just uh, uh, numbers and dollars and cents. As an employer, how much are you going to contribute to the premium? You don't have to contribute 100%. Uh, but you want to have a balance here so that people do take the coverage or people 
have uh, the ability to afford the coverage in some way, shape, or form if you're trying to make it attractive to employees and to retain people. If you're charging the, the full amount for premium to the employee, then the competitive advantage probably isn't going to be there. So if you're doing it to attract employees, if you're doing it to retain employees, you want to have that uh, contribution. You want to think that through. Uh, and one of the most important things that I found over the last uh, couple of years after healthcare reform came out is that the definition of what a group is has changed. We found that the vast majority of the people we were serving were husband, wife, fam, uh, family plans. Their husband and wife were working for a company, and it would be two people on the plan. So now you have two people. Now we're a group, and they would get health insurance at a group rate. After healthcare reform, that no longer is the case. You have to have at least one common law employee. So husband and wife are not common law employees or husband and wife. It does not form a group. You need somebody else that's an employee. Otherwise, you are not a group and you cannot get group insurance. This is something that has ended up becoming uh, and shifting uh, the business significantly. Uh, if you're running a business, you have four or five employees. This is not an issue. You're a group. But if it's something where it's a small family health business, this is a, a sticking area that could uh, make a big difference in what you're able to purchase. Uh, so the keys here are know the doctors, know the prescriptions. If you can't uh, or it's uh, an awkward situation or awkward conversation, try and get an, uh, um, an insurance professional to kind of get in between to have that conversation for you um, because there's anonymity there. The insurance person is not working with them on a daily basis. There's, you don't have to worry about being embarrassed that perhaps you're suffering from depression or you have uh, bipolar and you're under medication and you work fine, but you don't really want your employer knowing about it. You want to kind of break down that barrier a little bit. Uh, for dental insurance, uh, this pays for a portion of the cost involved with dental care. This is not as regulated health, as health insurance. So there's a lot of variability that's available here. So the key points here is to, when uh, when purchasing the coverage, make sure you're okay with the annual limits. Whereas health insurance, there is no limits. Uh, if you get cancer and they spend $2 million on a, a treatment plan for a year, there's no more uh, limits of loud. That's one of the, the one of the features of healthcare reform. With dental insurance, there is, and it might be a thousand dollars, twelve hundred, two thousand dollars for the for the better plans. You just want to make sure you're comfortable with it. You get what you pay for. So if you choose less, you get less. If you choose more, you get more. So you just want to make sure you're comfortable with it. Um, again. Either is it for you, and if it's for you, you want to make sure you know what your dental health is, uh, what the expenses are going to be to an extent. Uh, if you're uh, looking towards employees, you, there's a cost involved with having higher limits. You want to kind of balance that out. Uh, this is another area where you want to make sure that uh, your dentist is part of the network that you're in. Uh, so make sure if you have a good relationship with a dentist that they will take your insurance. And... Uh, Make sure you're okay with the percentages being paid by the insurance company because this can vary too. So if, if you've seen uh, dental insurance in the past, there are uh, different categories of coverages. Um, and preventative, minor, and major services. So preventative would be like a cleaning. Uh, those things tend to be uh, tend to be on the uh, 100% uh, 100% uh, I'm losing the word here. These things tend to be uh, covered at 100%. So it, it's the insurance company encouraging you to take care of the teeth in the first place because that would save long-term for the insurance company. The second category would be minor. So this is just a quick filling. Uh, this is something that's very small and simple. And each company defines these things differently. So I'm not going to get too far into the details there because every company is different in these. And then there's major. A major is something like a root canal having a cap put on. Minor, you'll find it's 60% reimbursement, 70% uh, reimbursement. Some plans will do 100% reimbursement on this, but you will use that annual limit up quicker. On major, you tend to find it's only going to be 50 or 60 reimbursement at best. And sometimes there's waiting periods. If you sign up for a dental insurance, you may find that the major coverage doesn't kick in for the first year. Just make sure you know what you're buying and just make sure it, it does meet your needs. 
and again, make sure that that dentist is in network and that there that any of the employees, the majority of them can see a dentist. If you're in a small town and there's only one dentist, make sure they're in the network. Uh, if you're in a major city, this probably isn't as much of an issue, but that's, uh, again, you want to make sure it's, you're paying the money for the premium. You want to make sure that it's satisfying your needs. And do you need the coverage? If it's a small family business and everybody's teeth are 100% healthy, you may not need to have dental insurance. You you want to make sure you're getting an advantage out of it. If you're a person that wants to have that coverage there, should something pop up, obviously there's nothing wrong with it. And this is another area where it can be purchased uh, uh, as an individual as well. So just uh, look at it from the perspective. If it's just you and your family and a couple uh, employees, and they don't see value in it. This is not necessary. You don't have to have this. So just be be sure that when you're purchasing it, you need it. Uh, this is one of those areas where if you just save up your money, you may come out ahead. The only thing that is an advantage to dental insurance that that wouldn't help you in by just saving up your money is that dental insurance companies do negotiate rates on your behalf. So you may find that uh, a root canal costs more uh, when you buy out of pocket going straight to the dentist than if you went through an insurance company. And that's something that's uh, kind of a subtle uh, subtle savings possibly in there. But just be aware of that. Vision insurance uh, pays for vision correction. It does not pay for eye surgery or glaucoma treatments or, or anything like that. It, those would be health insurance items. This pays for your glasses, pays for contact lenses. It, it pays for the exam to see whether your uh, vision needs to be corrected or not. So this benefit uh, is one that, again, you just you want to debate yourself. Does this make sense for you as a company or as a, uh, a person or a business owner? Vision insurance is one of the areas where just saving your money can often uh, put you ahead of the game. Uh, if you're running a business with 20, 30 employees, now vision insurance becomes part of the benefit package. It's not expensive coverage. So now you're showing a more robust package. So it's really one of those that are you trying to increase your perceived value to uh, employees and retain them. The overall cost for business insurance is relatively low, but with what I found with a lot of the vision centers and stuff, they're always running so many deals that just going and getting an exam and getting glasses, you might find that the costs are close to equal. So just be very wary of, of going with uh, vision insurance. There's nothing wrong with it. And the larger the group, the the more uh, likely you are to find a, a benefit with offering it so that employees look at it and say, oh, that, that vision insurance, I need glasses. They see value in it, uh, even though the actual cost benefit on this one is very close to uh, um, the amount you put in is the amount you get out. And then also make sure that the network you choose does have stores or providers in the area. You can, you don't want to buy coverage you can't use. And, and that's obviously a theme here. It, nobody here, uh, nobody in the insurance industry is trying to, well, I shouldn't say nobody. Nobody I know of in the insurance industry is trying to sell you stuff that you can't use. Uh, we're trying to satisfy real needs. Uh, so make sure you have the real need and then make sure you can use the coverage should it be needed. Group life. Uh, this is one it's it's common uh, for uh, employers to have group life, uh, but I also think there's a, a subtle reason why it can be uh, vitally important to have it uh, available to your employees. This can be paid by uh, for by the employees or the employer, and you can split how much uh, you you pay for it versus the employees pay for it. Uh, typically, the the there's low face value uh, on the on the coverages that you put in place. So face value is the basically the death benefit. So if somebody passes away and they're covered under a group life plan, they get the face value gets paid out to whoever their beneficiary is. It doesn't go to the business; it goes to the beneficiary. If an employer is paying, uh, paying, pay very much uh, attention to the fifty thousand dollar mark. It changes the tax status of the benefit. So a lot of benefits are going to be uh, pre-tax. Group life is one of them when the face value is less than $50,000. When it's above $50,000, you have to pay taxes on that. It's no longer a tax-free benefit. So just be wary of that mark. 
the reason I find this to be something that could be vital to the employees is there's people out there who can't get insurance. Uh, somebody who's extremely overweight or has diabetes or is a smoker or or has had a past with cancer, uh, they may not be able to go on the open market and buy life insurance. With group, there's relaxed underwriting. They don't ask as many questions. They may ask questions that make people unable to get the insurance still, but this gives them a greater opportunity. Um, if they're individually underwritten, which means the insurance company looks at them as individuals and looks at their health insurance as to whether it is or is not uh, a good risk for the insurance company. With group, they look at it as a whole. Now, if the person had a heart attack in the last year, there may be, depending on the plan you buy, something saying, no, that person, we can't offer it to that person. But you may give an employee the ability to pay for a funeral. Uh, you may give a family the ability to pay uh, rent uh, for a while before they have to move or make life adjustments because they lost the breadwinner in the family that was not uh, available to them, even if they were trying to be prudent and buying the open market, you may actually be able to provide an opportunity for them to get coverage that was not going to be otherwise available. So it's an area where this is one where you can take care of employees. The costs on group life can be uh, inexpensive. It really depends on your census. So if everybody working for your business is 60 years old, it's going to cost more. If uh, you tend to have 18 to 25 year olds, it's going to cost less. It's uh, it is underwritten as a group not as individuals. Uh, and there may be stipulations for individuals, uh, like I said, if they've had uh, some of the uh, named diseases within a certain period of time. So just be wary of what you, you are purchasing. So the, the cost benefit on this one tends to be pretty high. Uh, and if there's any way to explain it to employees of exactly what you're taking care of here, it, it could end up being uh, one that can uh, be more attractive to employees than some of the others in a cost uh, benefit ratio. So if you paying six bucks a month could end up saving a family from basically one of the worst times of their lives, keeping them from having to make uh, very, very difficult decisions when stress levels are already as high as possible. This is one of those areas that, uh, as you probably could tell, it's uh, one that uh, I, I find quite important. Uh, Short-term disability. This is uh, what I'm talking about here is not uh, the statutory, uh, which would be a one uh, max is 170 a week. This is uh, purchasing additional insurance, so you can do uh, an enhancement on your statutory, uh, your statutory uh, uh, New York State disability, which would take that 170 and you could double it and triple it and, and make it much more robust. So it actually can help pay a significant amount of the bills. Uh, should you be out of work. This pays uh, your uh, or your employees uh, uh, replacement of wages, basically, if they get hurt off the job. So if there's a sickness or they get hurt off the job, this pays for a portion of their wages. Uh, it'll never pay for 100%, uh, but it will pay for a bit of it. Uh, there is going to be a time deductible. So you have to wait generally seven days. That's something I think you can buy back from the insurance company so that there is no waiting period. But most employers, I think, want that little bit of uh, a gap between when the person actually gets hurt and can't come to work and how long before they start having a benefit paid out. And, and that's generally when people have their sick time. That's what they have a little bit of savings for. This is uh, for a little longer than those very short-term illnesses. So in the... In the, uh, the payment on this is going to be like you can get it so that it's paying a certain dollar amount or you can get it so it's paying a percentage of wages so it could be 60 percent uh i've seen 66 percent could be 50 percent uh, this comes in in on top of the statutory so you, you want something that subsists uh, helps people subsist even when they're uh down um in in sick or ill it pays for a portion of what their expenses are going to be uh, and you want to make sure you have a level that you think fits the needs of, of your group uh, in this case, and, and that may be yours as an employer as well because you can be on the plan. And then you want to make sure that you have a duration of benefits that makes sense. In most cases, we find this being about 26 weeks, uh, and then we match that up with a long-term uh, disability plan, which is structured a little differently and goes much longer. So 
this is just for the short term. And then there's also long term that we kind of match up with this because that's when somebody has an illness, they're not going to be coming back to their work for the foreseeable future. There's going to be a kind of an extended period. And that's where the, the next slide is going to be for long term disability. So again, it just helps supplement the income for an employee uh, that can't work due to a disability. A lot of people think, you know, I'm young, I'm invincible, this never happened to me. Um, but people do get cancer. Uh, people do have heart attacks, people have strokes, people um, get into car accidents. P you know, things happen to people, even healthy people have weird things that come up and, and may make it so that they can no longer uh, work. This keeps them from going bankrupt before they get recovered to the point where they can earn an income again. This should be coordinated with the short-term disability so there's no gap. So if your short-term goes for 26 weeks, you should have your long-term start at 26 weeks. Uh, some people will start it at 12 weeks. Most of the long-term and the short-term companies, uh, you would probably go with the same company for both and just match it right up so that there's, it'd be nearly seamless between the two. Uh, the benefit periods here can be very important. So depending on what you're looking to offer to employees, you're looking at uh, up to two years of coverage is, is kind of the short side of long-term disability. You could also have it go up to a certain age. So maybe when you think that they would be retiring like 65, so it would pay about to that level. Um, some have it set up so it, it goes until people can go for social security disability income. The qualifications for that are very specific. But once that kicks in, the long-term disability would stop paying and the Social Security uh, disability would pay, start paying instead. The longer the long-term disability goes, uh, the higher the premium is going to be. So you always want to just balance it with the actual costs. Uh, so if you want it to be in place until Social Security kicks in, and most of your, your employees are between 20 and 25, the likelihood of them being disabled is less. But the chances, uh, if they're disabled, of going for a significant amount of time on that plan is greater. So there, this is one of those areas where the, the premiums can vary significantly depending on what you want to choose. You just want to kind of plan it out and make sure that you're getting what you wanted and getting what you paid for. This also could be purchased as a as a individual product, but it's going to be individually underwritten. If a person is healthy, you're going to find that it's probably cheaper to go and get stuff on the open market if they're if they're a very very healthy person who's active and 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 doesn't have a history of of disabilities. Uh, and that by that I mean like a, a history of, of diabetes in the family or a history of cancer in the family or heart attacks things like that because they will underwrite for those things. If uh, you're a healthy person, going and buying as an individual probably is less, but this is an area where somebody who has a, uh, a family history or is overweight or smokes or things like that, the people that are more likely to have uh, some kind of an illness pop up or some kind of, or is more likely to have accidents um, and not be able to recover quickly, a group insurance plan is probably going to uh, show them a significant amount of savings over something they can buy on the open market. So it does come down to what is your particular employee group or your uh, particular concerns. Uh, so buying an individual may actually uh, be in somebody's best interest, but it really comes down to the individual. So accident and others. Um, these are often offered as volunteer benefits uh, where employees can choose what they like and what they don't like. So you just say, hey, we offer um, – um, probably the most popular one out there is Aflac, um, and, and I almost can't say it without it sounding like I'm, I'm doing an ad for them. Um, but there's also Allstate, there's also Colonial, there's also, uh, um, I believe Lincoln also offers uh, employee uh, benefits. Um, it, it's often no cost to the employer. So it, it's something you just make available to your employees. So this could be one where you're showing value to the employees. You're showing that uh, something is available to them. You're bringing it um, to them. They have the opportunity to say yes or no to it. Um, there's also no cost uh, to the employer. The only thing is that there will be paperwork involved in, in, on the back end to make sure that you know that if you're pulling premiums out of somebody's paycheck, that those premiums are in fact going to the insurance company. So there is a um, operations cost to it, uh, but it's not uh, it's not something that actually you're paying for the the coverage itself. So 
accident uh, insurance, and this is the one where we've seen the ads. Uh, everybody's seen the the, uh, the doc. Um, this pays for expenses with accidents that healthcare does not. Healthcare is going to pay f if you're, let's say, you're going for a hike and you slip down a hill and you smash your knee onto a tree. And it turns out there's damage. Uh, you go to the hospital. They treat it. The insurance company is going to pay for the trip to the hospital if it's if it's an ambulance ride. They're going to pay for the treatments. They're going to pay for um, the physical therapy. They're going to pay for like, any surgery that might be needed. But what they're not going to pay for is other expenses that might be incurred because of this. What, what an accident does is it says, oh, you had a hospital ride? Here's another $200. If you're, if you're going to get x-rays, here's another $300 because you had x-rays. If you have um, expenses that are out there. You don't have to prove the expenses. You just basically show over, show that the medical expenses occurred and then they pay you a set amount. Uh, this this is one where a lot of people with children uh, can take a huge amount of uh, advantage of this. Uh, as a father, um, kids get hurt. You take them to the take them to the uh, urgent care center uh, because they have a cut. You're not sure whether it needs stitches or not. I have personally been paid out by accident insurance companies um, because I had a, a kid with a, a cut in her toe and I knew that she was going to be running around a pool and I wanted to get it healed as quickly as possible. Stitches occurred and uh, actually the, the glue, they used the glue instead uh, and sent it in to my uh, accident insurance company and they sent the check that uh, partially paid for some of the expense of going there the other time uh, that I spent uh, sitting in the waiting room and getting it treated. And the insurance company obviously paid for the actual treatment. So basically, accident insurance pays for the other expenses that are involved with health care that aren't health expenses. There are other coverages out there like cancer coverage. Basically, it, it pays out if a person uh, that's covered is diagnosed with a cancer. Uh, there are a lot of expenses that come along with something like cancer that are not health expenses. If somebody's under chemo. Uh, their their expenses are not just the chemo or not just the physician visits or the, the follow-ups. Somebody's driving them there. Um, they're taking time off from work every time that happens. Uh, there There's the fact that they're taking time off from work because they're not feeling uh, well, even if it's a minor, um, minor is a wrong word here, if it's one of the uh, cancers where the treatment isn't as uh, detrimental to their health in itself, there's still going to be bad days. Cancer uh, policies tend to pay out in lump sums. So if you get cancer, they're going to pay out a lump sum. There are other ones where they're going to, you, you send in the bill, you send in, uh, let's say, mileage, things like that, and then get reimbursement. But the lump sum one seems like uh, one that seems to be most common out there. An area where you're making something available to somebody that if they're having one of the worst possible times in their life, they're going through cancer treatments. You as an employer can provide something that makes that a little less stressful. So, and this is something where you don't have to contribute to it. You just have to make it available to them. Um, so, you're as employers, you're, you're making things available that they wouldn't necessarily be able to go out and buy in the open market easily. Uh, you can still buy it, but the cost is going to go up when you're buying as an individual. So, th this is one that it's not about the health insurance uh, side of it. That's that's a different plan altogether. Th this is about the additional expenses that come along with something like a cancer. Critical illness is very similar to the cancer policy, um, but it is for other things too, heart attack, stroke, uh, things like that. Um, again, there's, there's more to these things uh, than just the health uh, costs in, in treatment. Uh, you, you may find that there's a lot of expenses that you weren't expect, uh, expecting that pop up that these can start to take care of. So, and, and then there's other areas too that um, I'm not going to get too far into them because they're they seem to be uh, um, less exact and not terribly close to insurance itself. But you can uh, prepay for legal fees uh, is one of the things you can do. Uh, I've seen uh, companies offer pet insurance, uh, so that's something that uh, some insurance uh, some do. And again. Just offering these things to employees might be something that helps uh, attract and keep employees. So it's just there are things out there that I'm not going to get too far into, but there are uh, many other types of uh, enhancements that you can add to uh, the employee's uh, benefit package with few expenses to yourself. So I'm um, just going to get into some of the do's and don'ts. Um, and 
one of the do's is have census data. Uh, and this is a when necessary thing. You're not always going to need this. Um, but you do want to have an idea of employees, their birth dates, uh, expected income for the for the disability plans and things of that nature, uh, a list of dependents, because for health insurance, you're covering the dependents as well. Uh, list of dependents might come in when it comes to group life, if, if they're going to also be beneficiaries. A list of doctors and providers, again, if you're going to do that, that work yourself, uh, and medications necessary. So again, if you're doing that work yourself, I just look at this and uh, I once had to help manage um, a lot of this information coming in. And there's a lot of things that employees just don't necessarily want to share with their bosses. Uh, and for, I think, acceptable reasons. Especially if they're working hand in hand with you uh, day in, day out, they may not want to reveal everything, but it might be really important that it's taken into consideration. So um, this is an area where uh, you definitely want that information to be part of the decision-making process uh, when it comes to health insurance. Um, and make sure you have enough time to shop. Um, once a decision has been made to, to have employee benefits, there's a lot of paperwork that's going to need to be done and completed. Some of this will be completed by the employees. So once we have the decision, once we get the forms over to the employer, now we're handing it to the employees. They have to go home and go over it with spouses and get some security numbers and things of that nature. It takes some time to get all that back. We want to make sure we have everything in place so that we have a smooth startup. So this is one where you want to kind of be 60 days ahead. Um, things can be hurried, um, but you, you do have to know your employees. And if, depending on the size of your group, um, you know, it may be difficult to get everything done. Um, but I would say 60 days should give you enough time. But you don't want people left out just because they couldn't get the paperwork done in time. Especially if you're going, if you're trying to do things in the last couple of weeks before something starts, vacations occur. Are they near a fax machine? Uh, can they scan information in? Are you able to get a hold of them? So there, there's there's time frame things that you do want to give as much time as possible. Find someone you can trust to communicate well with. This this is vital in all insurance, but especially with employee benefits. Um, th in this area, it, it's really easy first to change who you work with. Um, there's a process out there called a broker of record uh, that can be filed. Um, if you have somebody that you've met, let's say a chamber mixer, if you uh, know somebody who's in the industry and you you just you click with them, you can sign a piece of paper and change them and they can become your broker or agent. You do not, uh, it, it's, of all the insurances, I don't think it's any easier um, in any of them than it is with employee benefits to switch up who you're working with. But it's also vital. If you can't communicate with them, you can make big mistakes. And those big mistakes, when it comes to employee benefits, when it comes to health insurance uh, um, or life insurance or disability, can have implications that are pretty vast uh, if somebody has something that's not covered that they needed to, or if you cut out of the formulary uh, a specific drug that somebody that works for you is using. Um, I've seen drugs that are $10,000 a month. And in, in you need to have somebody that you can trust to have that open communicate with, uh, communication with in order to make sure that you're not making mistakes that cut something like that out. So having that communication is absolutely vital. Um, I, I'm uh, a broker. So what we do is we work with many different companies. There are also agents that will work just with specifically with a company. The, the most important thing here is, is working with somebody that you can trust and that you can have that conversation with. Um, I would, if, if I were running a business and I was not part of Ulster, Ulster Insurance Services, I would definitely use a broker or somebody who could manage a lot of the back office things on this so they can have that conversation with your employees to make sure that uh, that everything that they absolutely need is uh, going to be covered without necessarily having to bring you into the loop on things. Uh, it's In this area, it's vital. Um, this is an area where many people do go directly to an insurance company, and that does not hurt your coverage. That does not affect your coverage, um, but it may change the perspective, and there may be things they can't tell you because they first don't know because they work for a company. They don't know all the other companies, but it may um, 
hyper narrow uh, what you're looking at in, in the in terms of what is available to you. So if you went directly to one insurance company, they can't tell you about the others that might have something that could make a big difference to an employee, whereas somebody who has a, a wider perspective might be able to do that. It is important to note that there is no price difference depend, depending on whether you go with a uh, carrier directly or whether you use somebody like a broker or an agent. Uh, under uh, New York State law, and everybody on the call I believe is in New York State, uh, they cannot charge a different amount. Brokers do not charge, agents do not charge a separate fee uh, for doing these things for you. So from my perspective, and again, I'm biased, I'm an, I'm a, an insurance broker, leverage their expertise, leverage their perspective on the marketplace, because they, they do this uh, more often than most employers do. They, they concentrate on a, uh, on a more common basis uh, than most uh, uh, business owners do. So leverage their expertise, but again, find somebody you can trust and communicate with so that that leveraging happens exactly how you want it to. Um, this is an area where you definitely want to maximize your coverage and custom cut it as much as you possibly can. So Again, if, if everybody in the play, in your business is between 20 and 25 years old and nobody's wearing glasses and has contacts, is vision really going to be a benefit to them? But if you know that everybody has glasses, maybe you want to get vision because it's going to enhance how they perceive the company. Uh, it might be cheaper to, to put a, a vision plan in place that's going to cost you you know 100 bucks a year um, than it is to give them a $500 raise at the end of the year. So you, you, I would look at this as part of the... Uh, package where you know, almost part of uh, the, the actual compensation, uh, you may find that some of these benefits offering it can lower the overall in terms of compensation while the employees value it more. So just be very uh, aware of that by, like I said, maximizing your coverage and custom cutting it uh, to your needs as much as possible. Um, uh, don't uh, don't change brokers by accident uh, or agents. So. One thing we found popping up in the industry a couple of years ago, and I expect it's still happening today, is that uh, there are some companies out there um, that uh, do insurance, uh, but they also do other things. And what they were doing was taking these letters, uh, these things called broker of record letters uh, or a BOR, and they were slipping it into the paperwork. Uh, people were signing up with them for completely different services and then getting a call from the insurance broker saying, hey, um, I noticed that you, you left us and we wanted to know why. And the employer had no idea that they had done it. Um, they were handed a stack of sheets that needed to be signed. And in that, there was that very simple letter to change brokers. So as much as I said it's easy to change brokers, there's the it's a double-edged sword. So there were companies out there that were just throwing the BORs into the paperwork. Uh, people had no idea that they were changing brokers. So if you're uh, doing um, business with a company out there, uh, in this case, it happened to be payroll companies um, that this was happening. I'm not going to get into specifics as to which ones because I actually can't recall if it was more than one or if it was um, just in general. But there's a lot of documents to be signed. Uh, you know, you have it, it's a, a business contract. Just be wary of what you're signing because you could end up uh, leaving somebody you trust that would no longer have the ability to help you while they're not your broker. They can't call their company on your behalf. The, the company would say. I'm sorry, but you have no right to speak on this employer's behalf at this moment. You're not the broker. And if there's a problem, you don't want that to be the time uh, when uh, something like this happens. It's all fixable, but you don't want to have that be the time when you need something urgent. Uh, somebody, an employee's spouse went into the, into the emergency room and they need to know what kind of coverage there is. Generally, what would happen is a broker or an agent would call the insurance company to get a, a feel uh, for what the coverage would be and then uh, would get back to you with that information. If you change brokers by accident, they're not going to be able to have that conversation. Uh, and that, unfortunately, at the time when we're calling in for somebody is when you find things like this out. Uh, so just be very careful about that. Don't just tell the insurance agent or broker uh, what you think they want to hear. You, you want to give the whole story. You want to be as accurate as possible uh, because they're there to help you. If you give them... Um, abbreviated information, the recommendations they make may not be the best. Uh, so you, you definitely want to have a good conversation. And that's where that trust and communication comes in. Make sure it's somebody that you can actually communicate with. Um, and, and don't sign up with, and I, I keep using the Uncle Bob just because it's a random name, out of family loyalty. Um, 
make sure somebody with experience that's been in the industry that that knows the subtleties between the different coverages, um, that knows the subtlety between the different companies, because each one is going to be slightly different. One may satisfy your needs completely, the other may not. Um, in this instance, and I don't say this on the other other uh, calls, uh, but use a broker um, or an agent in this case. There's no additional cost, uh, and you get to leverage their expertise. They may have increased perspective on the market that the buyer can't easily get on their own. All the stuff's on the internet, but it's not easy to narrow it down to what is for uh, which information is most important to you. This particular type of insurance takes more time to manage, so often uh, an insurance professional can manage much of it for you at no additional cost. Uh, so they can enroll, disenroll, add, remove dependents, COBRA management, all of that. Uh, and then another is just maintain your deductibles, make sure they're accurate. Uh, what's not covered? Just important to know that cosmetic surgery is not covered and cosmetic dental work is not covered. Uh, so cosmetic surgery would be covered after something like um, uh, cancer uh, had to remove and then they want to um, diminish the scar um, or after an accident and there was an actual injury. Um, so then cosmetic, if you're having the tooth repaired and you want it to look like the other teeth, that's going to be covered, but not veneers uh, for, just, for just the purpose of uh, or teeth whitening, things like that. Uh, and know who you're dealing with. Is it a captive agent? Are they working for the company? Uh, are they a broker where they're dealing with many companies? Or is it just a website uh, where you do want to look into that further because it's easy to make um, unusual choices uh, with, with a website? It, it's easy f to get overly narrowed down into uh, choices that uh, may not be the ones you want to make. Uh, so uh, for now, um, thank you for listening. And I'm um, just going to open it up to questions if anybody has any. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, now's a good time. Great. Thank you, John. Um, we'll give folks a few minutes to get their questions together. As I mentioned, just a quick note about the New York SBDC. We are a network of 22 campus-based centers and satellite offices across New York State. We provide free business advising and free and low-cost business training like this webinar in person and online to all New York State residents. So if you have any questions about the New York SBDC, um, you can definitely reach out to me after the webinar. We'll be sending a follow-up email with the webinar recording um, and some information on future webinars. Kimberly, I just saw your hand up and I unmuted you if you have sound. And if you don't have sound, you can, you can type in your question. I do, actually. I was trying to figure out how to do that. That's why it's taking Perfect. a little while. Um, okay. I just, I'm, I'm a new business owner. I've been in business for about a year. I have a small staff of one employee and I, and I have a spouse that's not part of the business, but obviously, um, you know, we both need coverage as well. Um, so I just wanted to talk about, you know, how to start out for someone that has a small group, not a lot of budget, you know, trying to earn a profit or at least start earning a profit in a new business. What would be some good advice for someone in that position? Well, the first thing is, as long as the employee is not a, uh, it, the one employee is not your your spouse, you, you, you should be able to qualify as a group. But um, if you're uh, on the small side, you, you do want to look at the overall cost. Um, and health insurance, if that's where you're looking to start, is not going to be uh, inexpensive. Uh, if your husband's a full-time employee of another business, often we find uh, the very small businesses will get it through the spouse. If you're looking to take care of the employee, now you, you want to uh, look at it from that perspective and find out what their needs are if they need it. When you're that small, be just you want to have the conversation with the employee because there's times when offering could be detrimental to the employee because of healthcare reform. So make sure they don't already have coverage um, that uh, they're getting with tax benefits. So to offer it might make those tax benefits not available to them. So I would have a conversation with the employee um, if it's health insurance. In terms of group insurance, all of these should work uh, with a group of at least two. Uh, so uh, you might want to have a conversation with the employee and find out what's valuable to them. Or if there's things that you think you would like to have, just write a list of the things that you think might uh, might benefit you. Uh, and then uh, find somebody that's in your local community that is experienced that would be able to kind of walk you through uh, whether there's something available to you or not. But if you can get coverage through a spouse, um, the cost benefit there ends up usually winning out. If you're looking to provide for an employee, then there's a little more math involved. But health insurance is 
for I mean I think we're looking at a minimum of six hundred dollars a month at this point. So you have to kind of uh, weigh those two things. So it's not an automatic that it's the best thing to provide um, health insurance. Uh, so I would make sure that the employee has a need or you have a need before going forward. Great, and I just unmuted Kimberly in case she had any follow-up questions to that. Yes, I just wanted to thank you. That was a good overview of kind of where I'm at. Um, my spouse is self-employed, so we don't have that option, and my employee is about to you know, come off of his parents' insurance, so we definitely uh, do have a need, both for him and I, for you know, probably within the next six months. Then yes, then I would I would definitely explore it, um, and just uh, yeah, and then yeah, you're definitely a group if you have an employee and they're and they're working for you. So I would definitely explore it, and then just kind of feel out what you want the contribution to be. Um, you want it to be, you want to have a balance between it not uh, drawing all money out of the business, but also at the same time that it's attractive enough that the employee can in fact afford it. So and that's only uh, a number that you can come up with uh so that that's one where there is a subtlety that uh, you kind of have to look at the cost benefit there i have a question um i have like a, a life insurance uh, from uh combined life insurance and they usually often um saying that they're going to send uh twenty dollars each time you go to the doctor but I never. I wanted to know why they would just give you twenty dollars because of you go to the doctor and the benefits we have, the policy we have with them is accident and sickness coverage. Do you know why? Well, I mean, really, it's, that's just because of the way that their plan is written. Um, so it, the the why there might just be that's what they felt was going to be attractive to get people to buy the plan. Um, and they feel that the amount of times they're paying out that twenty dollars for them uh, is uh, a cost that they're willing to absorb in order to attract people to sign up for the plan. Um, there's no like insurance companies; they reduce things that they think will keep you healthier, so that there's uh, a, so that you're less likely to have major issues later. That's health insurance companies in that case. But it, when, it, when it comes to something like a combined life, and then it, which is like a sickness or an accident plan, it's probably just to make it more attractive to people, get people to sign up because they feel that that $20 is an expense that they're willing to uh, pay out to make it attractive because they feel that maybe they're paying out for a family of six. They're paying out that $20 you know, once a month. There might be somebody out. There might be six people that are uh, individuals on the plan that never use that benefit. So – they've done some math in the background um, that they think to them, this makes them more attractive. That's the only thing I can assume, but I don't personally deal with the combined life. I've heard of them. I've, I've heard that they have a great reputation. So I have to assume that that's what they're, they're doing. Um, but not having seen the plan, I can't know for sh for sure. I haven't been in meetings where they had that discussion, but I would imagine that's what it is. They, they just threw something in there to make it more attractive. Yes, I have another question. When you said flat, uh, I want to know if, as I have a um, unemployment agency, I'm a startup, so I wanted to know, can I provide that for, because I cannot afford, like, you know, employee benefits right now, so is there a way um, to give a little bit more information about the um, flat, you said, benefits? Oh, like volunteer benefits? Yeah, you, that's like you can make them available. Yeah, that's actually it's quite simple um, to make it available to the employees if they if they and then basically a company rep will come in um, and they will sit down and go through whatever you want to offer to the employees and give them the ability to uh, sign up. Uh, so that would be volunteer um, coverage. They will sometimes have a minimum that they need to have at least three people sign up for a plan in order to offer it or have or there may be different rules like they have to have at least three plans signed up for it to offer it to the group but that's um depends on which insurance company they all are going to have slightly different underwriting standards uh as to what they will and won't write um and then you would have that come right out of their paychecks if you wanted to uh, depending on how you have your payroll running of course if anybody has any follow-ups after the fact um uh, feel free to reach out um uh, uh, email address is on the screen. So if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, be happy to talk with you.